which is a five-day hands-on intensive, um, and immediately went home and did exactly what he says not to do, which is like, don't mess with the system. It's tried and true, it works really well. I know you guys are Americans and you think, well, if this works great, I can do it better. I, you know, I, yeah, totally guilty. I had used folic acid to help germination the previous <laughs> year. And so I was like, okay, well, if folic acid worked really well and I got great fast germination, then maybe folic acid plus SES will do even better. And I, it was actually, I loved that I did it because it was really fascinating and it was a very, very instrumental point in my relationship with Korean Natural Farming that taught me to just stop second guessing it and just, I didn't know why things worked at that time. After years of this practice, I totally understand the why of it but it, it takes a certain letting go of the control, like I talked about. Let, let go of your idea that you're gonna control things and just trust in the process until you understand. So I did plain water, I did plain SES solution, and I did SES plus folic acid. And I utilized cannabis and I utilized loofah. And I tracked throughout the life of these plants and it was absolutely fascinating. So the germination rate of the plain water, I think ended up at 95%. Germination of SES ended up at 100% about three days earlier than anything else. Germination of SES plus fulvic acid, I think, ended finally at like 70 or 75%. So it didn't germinate as well. And then the growth of the plants through their life cycle was mind-bogglingly bad. So my loofah gourds, after three months or two months, I think, had... Um, no, maybe it's sooner than that. I tracked the whole thing on Instagram and talked about it. But at one point, it was like they were six inches shorter across the board 
from even just the plain water uh, as the life cycle went on and on. Very the, ed or the, you, which solutions are you talking the, about? As the, the folic acid plus SES was six inches shorter like across the board and less germination and slower to germinate and just they struggled. And with the cannabis, after three months, I have a photo where I was just like, this is, I actually had to go get my mom, which I do frequently because she's one of my team members. And I'm like, mom, am I, what do you see when you look at this? Because maybe I'm biased and I'm seeing something that I want to see that isn't there. The weed plants that had the SES and the weed plants that had the water were doing pretty well. They, you know, were, their nutrients were working the way that they should, like everything was looking good. The ones that had folic acid just showed extreme nutrient deficiency. They were not able to mobilize nitrogen properly. Um, and it held through the whole entire cycle. All I did was soak seeds overnight. That was it. The only difference that those plants ever got. And it was just phenomenally interesting to me to see that it, it impacted that badly. So, yeah, would I, will I, you know, you know, I will, I will, of course I will now, because now I'm curious. I will totally take some, I'll, I'll have some sacrificial plants that will pull out and do it the way you would do a tree and knock off the soil and let it dry out. I don't think I'll do it for a full 24 hours. You don't have to knock off all the soil necessarily. You can do one meat, one of each. Do one of each, like he's going to build it for me. <laughs> so, uh, one follow-up. Uh, there was a uh, considerable difference throughout the life of the plant, was there not? Yeah, yeah, even through, like I said, like at three months it was distinctive, very, very easy to see. At harvest it was, it was less visible, but the overall yield suffered. And then the other thing I would mention too is that we haven't necessarily knocked the soil off of clones and let them I was just but, saying that. You know, clone trays do dry out, and oftentimes when we are dipping them in SES, they're kind of dried out at that point. We, we make sure we're not dipping them when they're just. I'm not water. great at clones, you guys. <laughs> it's not my strong. So you've already <laughs> run this trial by neglect. Yes, it is run. Anybody else who's got questions? So I have a question for Ben because we were talking during break. Um, I missed part of his talk, and. The wells for the geothermal that you guys are doing. The question that I kind of touched on but didn't really get to was like, you know, in California, our aquifers are very dry. They are they're very deep now. And so the question, and it's really more of just me kind of poking at him, was like, well, what happens when the aquifers dry up? Yeah. Fair enough. In the northeast? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe not in the northeast. So first off, you know where we are, right? We get rained on. Of course. But you have all of our water. Yes, we have all Give of our water. Give it back. Um, okay. So the answer is basically there's no water actually extracted from the system. When you're doing deep well hydrothermal, you're just cycling the water through a set, through the system, and you're pulling the natural heat and or cool, depending on which depth you go, from the actual earth itself. So there's no loss of water from the system, so there is no draining of the aquifer. You're not actually okay. taking anything out. It's a closed-loop system. Okay. You're just passively basically pulling either hot or cool from it, depending on which depth you go from. How do you know how deep to go? Engineers, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very blunt. When I know things, I know them, and I'll tell you. If I don't know it, I'll tell you I don't know it. I'll be super honest with you. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I hire a specialist if I was going to do it. Cool. Like, the best specialist, for sure. Yeah. That's a big, big, expensive job. You don't want to don't mess up. Yeah. What are you guys most excited for this coming year? Mm. Not uh, paying twenty thousand dollars to measure yeah. tax. <laughs> what is the very bottom line on my sheet of paper? What projects are you excited about? <laughs> this dude literally just Boom. read my mind. So uh, we're gonna actually go down the line. We'll start with Chris, and I want to know what kind of, of what new projects that you're involved in, or that um, you know you've been involved in that you're really excited about moving forward. Yeah, some things I'm actually really cautious not to talk about that are in like formation because it, I feel like for me it can change uh, a, a, my heart towards something if I talk a lot about it before I do it all of a sudden it's like oh well I got the enjoyment out of that project already maybe I don't need to complete it. Um, but um, I am really excited about um, the dairy farm in Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. It's, um, it's a piece of the puzzle, um, and uh, yeah, some of the That's farms, 
This is Tom, yeah, um, Thomas Stack in Ireland, and he's, um, he's a great farmer. He's um, passionate to teach and share um, while not stopping farming, which is, and, and he has kind of the personality and demeanor to do that, and, and that's not guaranteed. There's some great farmers that are never going to talk about it, you know, and um, I'm really stoked about their success, but some people want to be a part of sharing it, and that's, that's pretty special. So Thomas is uh, knfdairy.com, and uh, he is he's going to be a catalyst to revolutionize the dairy industry, is my firm belief, which is, um, is massive. It's huge. Um, and um, it's just through, you know, simple farming, kind of like that philosophy from Master Cho's, you know, be a, a, a aroma of a, you know, a strong aroma flower on a mountain far away and the bees will still fly to it. And um, he's, he's getting a lot of attention from in Europe for just, just farming a different way. So I'm excited about that. And I visited Leslie Kakamis in Napa um, and she has run her trial and is going to continue, um, and uh, it went well, and farming. She also had troubles, and they were pretty unrelated to running the KNF trial. She farmed 700 acres in that valley, Yonville. They've been doing that for 40 years, and she is running KNF trials. I think they did um, almost 20 acres last year, um, but... Uh, I thought they did 10. It was 10. But she also... Follow up. How long has she been doing pre natural farming? Only, um, only two years. Um, this is her second year trial, and um, yeah. And was, this is great lines for wine. Just yeah, sorry. If people don't know what Napa grows. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that will be interesting. She's dealing with powdery mildew, which is a uh, something they can't deal with easily in grapes or organically, and um, and so she's had a lot of success with that. But um, she's also had tri real difficulty implementing because she has like 30 locations and they're you know up mountains and road you know windy roads and she's trying to move um, natural farming products into an already complex operation and uh, just that learning curve of just integrating is probably been the most uh, difficult to surmount if, uh, trial on the whole thing but yeah it was I'm excited about that and it's still uh, still a process she had a terrible time fermenting natural fermenting, natural farming wine, but she is not a winemaker, and so she's going to hand it off to somebody that is this next year. So maybe we'll get a case. Um, before we move to Suzanne, one other quick follow-up. Um, you spoke about the learning curve, which is can be quite steep for green natural farming. And uh, what would you recommend for people is the best way forward uh, to learn? What's the best way? Uh, would you recommend an in-person class, or is YouTube the best way? How do you get the best instruction, and who do you think, um, you know, where should you go? I mean, I know you offer Korean natural farming classes. Uh, can you maybe mention, uh, again, where they're going to be at and where uh, they can go to register for those classes? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, so I talk to a lot of people from Africa. And um, I've seen some beautiful farms spring up. I've, I've seen a piggery, a commercial piggery combined with chicken operation in Africa. And they, his family, like his brothers and people built this piggery. Um, and it is like a thousand pig complex and thousands of chickens. And they're making their own feed with just a tiny bit of free information on the internet and they're crushing it. They don't have smell, super proud of their project. And so um, that's just with the f simply the free information on the internet. And they ask a few questions periodically, but not a ton. And so I just, I encourage people, like you might be the kind of person that can just get into some, some of those videos and with a few trials, like really do it. And, and there's, there's people doing exactly that. And that's 100% free. All the information's there to succeed. It just takes practice and failure. And if you're okay with failure, then you'll do great. Um, jump, yeah, jump starting, um, doing the taste, touch, smell class where you can experience it. 
is um, there's no comparison. No ko'oi is number one in Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Um, but the, um, there's a cost, there's getting a week off of work, um, you know, and uh, that's, you know, it's, it's like giving up your one year vacation for some people, and that's hard. So there is an online class, um, and that is available on chrisdrump.com. Thank you, James, for that. And, um, but yeah, I, I really encourage, even if you are going to take a class, to play with all of it. Give it a try at least once because you will, it'll, you'll learn so much more from actually doing it because you'll be like, wait, why didn't that work? You know, good questions. And so, um, yeah, and, and who knows, you might just be like, everything worked for me, this is great, and, and uh, I don't need a class. And, and it's really, that's a great answer, and that's why the videos are there. All right, Suzanne, what are you excited about? Not growing, going to Chris's taste class. I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> I made Suzanne. I didn't make her, but I I may have kind of put winged dirt into drinking some liquid IMO. And if you know Suzanne, that's that's not kosher. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of a soda white bread kind of girl. So yeah. Tater tots. Tater tots, potato <laughs> products. Yeah. And I almost because I saw bubbles, there was hopes I thought it was soda maybe being out in the Way out there in California where soda was hard to come by, but nope, it was dirt Kool-Aid. So, <laughs> it, it might be when I was a kid, you got dirt in your mouth, I'm like, yep, that's the taste. But we're still friends, I'll keep them. So, um, so my excitement is a project that we wanted to start a couple years ago, but because of COVID we couldn't. I'm working on a project with UC Davis where we are going to be collecting the genetic material from the cannabis aphid, Ford on Cannabis which is one of the major pests in cannabis these days. Um, thank you to the cannabis industry. It is now spread to the all lower 48 and completely across Canada um, because it's host specific to cannabis and it's moved on cuttings because cannabis has no uh, phytosanitary system set up for moving plant material like we do in the ornamental and vegetable market. You can't ship plants um, and uh, ornamentals and vegetables without a, a basically a certificate of inspection saying that it's insect and disease free. And so what's happened now since cannabis has moved all these plants, this aphid now has spread across the country. But what we want to look at is, is this all from the same cultivar pocket? I'm using it because we have biotypes and in insects, you have cultivars and plants. And we want to look at the genetics to see if it's all from the West Coast or do we have different introductions because when you talk to Europeans about this particular species of aphids, they talk about it a little differently than we do here. We're wondering if it's a different biotype in Europe than what we have because once you get into biotypes like cultivars, they behave differently and even management can be different. So I'm very excited for us to uh, ramp that program up again and so I'll be back out collecting this particular aphid. Um, if anybody comes up with campus aphid, let me know because it'd be great to get samples sent out to UC Davis where they can start looking at the genetics. So I'm pretty excited about that. Another project that we're kind of at a standstill right now, um, a friend of mine, which I'm sure some of you have read his work, Whitney Cranshaw, he was um, out in Colorado. He's now retired from the university, but he, um, in his hemp russet mite colony, had actually found a predatory mite feeding on hemp russet mites. And we're all excited. It's not a commercially produced one. We have not been able to find anybody that can ID it to species yet. Um, and this is what I'm going to tell you. Matching pictures online is not how you ID insects. It is very complicated. It's very complicated. Um, and so I'm hoping we can push forward and continue trying to find somebody on the planet that can get us an ID on this. Because if we do, then, and being that it was found in Colorado, there's potential for a predatory mite for hemp russet mite control. Because as of right now, there's no biocontrol agent commercially for hemp russet mite. So those are just two of the things that um, I'm excited about working on for this year. That's crazy cool. That's, so, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. So if you guys can't tell, if you don't know Suzanne, she's amazing and she's a super nerd on bugs and that's why we love her. So are you, are you, you're saying that a blurry video of a bug is not 
enough if you're positive about that. But, but what if you just zoom in? Yeah, if you zoom in with your <laughs> cell phone on a mine streaming yeah, across your soil, no. And anybody that can ID it for you is full of shit. Because <laughs> everybody, everybody now knows about hypoaspis miles because you buy it. So every single mite running across the soil is now hypoaspis miles. <laughs> Or the other thing I'm running to is people are calling them bulb mites. Bulb mites are not in cannabis. Bulb mites live on bulbs, not cannabis, but because of bad identification and bad YouTube videos, which I'm not gonna get too high on my soapbox of, so you better know who you're getting information from because there are a ton of charlatans in this industry who say they're entomologists or plant pathologists and they're not trained and they don't know what they're doing, but they're making tons of money off you guys. Because not that anybody is stupid, people are sometimes uneducated in an area because I'm not a specialist in other areas and someone could bullshit me completely on stuff. But when it comes to ID for insect and pathogens, you really need to be a specialist. And I've worked at it all my life and I still don't know all the insects. So you're saying number of Instagram followers is not a criteria yeah. for expertise? <laughs> So I'm going with the more followers you have, the probably the less you're actually out working because if you can sit in your house and produce content all day, it's because you're not out in the field working. My ass is on a plane every week going somewhere. I'm lucky if I get, well, you're going to get to see the possum video because my possum had babies, but I'm lucky to get stuff on social media because I'm working. And the people that can produce all the content ask for you to give them money for their content probably aren't actually working. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> Touchy we'll subject. We'll move on before we get started. I'm intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always intimidated though by her. <laughs> Just a real quick backstory on Suzanne. I met Suzanne at the first region ever in Portland, Oregon, and she started by calling it. It was amazing. I, I started clapping. I thought it was everybody else was like <gasps> horrified. But she was like, oh, so I'm here because I feel sorry for you guys. You guys are, like she just started going off on how the cannabis industry just really doesn't know their shit, especially when it comes to bugs. And, um, and anybody who repeated the story that Caltrans was releasing the, oh which one was it? Was it the hemp recipe? Well, no, they, the recipe? Said, they said they were releasing an area fired, which is a family yeah, of yeah, mites. Yeah, and it yeah. turns out hemp russet mite is a kind of area yeah. fired. But they don't understand area fives are species specific to what they attack. It was for thistle management. It was a thistle management. And I was the, one of the few people that had actually tapped into this and I researched it and I found the actual Caltrans report because I was like, I don't think our Caltrans is releasing mites on the freeways to impact the weed growers in the hills. This is just not really feeling valid to me. And uh, so I started, stood up and started clapping. I'm like, yay, no, sit back down. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I just, at that point, I was like, oh, I'm gonna meet that lady and I'm gonna be your friend because she's a badass. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, question to you now. What was the question? <laughs> what are you excited about? Oh subjects? gosh. What, what, project, what projects are you excited about moving into um, <laughs> This last couple of years have been really wild. There's, uh, there's so many things that we're doing that are really inspiring and exciting. Uh, the Ganji program that we put together three years ago now, and hopefully we're building out the next level this year, I think is the plan, is really, really exciting. That's another thing that kept me going last year, was having students come through. Um, for the, sorry, there's, there's actually a really great group of Ganjis here that you guys should talk with if you don't know what it is, um, if you're curious, but it is basically a sommelier program for weed. So a sommelier is a wine steward. They know all there is to know about wine. There's four levels of sommelier. We've built this out to have three levels of gangiers. And um, we've actually had sommeliers come through the course and we're like, compare it. Is it, are we like on point? And we've had them be like, this is like level one and half of level two in the first level. So you learn the history of cannabis, you learn about the genetics, you learn about the endocannabinoid system, you learn about cultivation, you learn about culture, you learn about so the social and economical society, side of it. It's like really, really phenomenal. And um, the students that have come through, I've gone to take them to my farm and you know do a tour and it's just been amazing to have people leave and like, you know, I'm second generation, I grew up around weed all the time, like seeing a big field full of ganja in the middle of the sun is not anything that's mind blowing to me, kind of like when I live in the redwoods, so I drive through the redwoods and I'm like, yeah, there's a bunch of big ass trees, I don't know. But having people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
But having people come through and just be like, oh, oh my gosh, like I had no idea that I would feel this way. Is, it's really, really, really good to keep me going. So that has been awesome. Um, we are planning on launching our topical line in Oklahoma, which is, I've been resistant to that because all you ever hear generally from feedback, and I've had so many meetings about the products that I used to produce in California that I can't now because I don't have a manufacturing license. Because again, as you know, some of Massachusetts people know, we don't have a million dollars to start that business. Um, so I've been resistant to that, and then talking with, you know, linking up with some people and talking, and they're like, oh, oh no, like the topicals in Oklahoma are crap, like you could crush it. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's gonna be exciting, and, and another adventure down, something that I'd kind of let go of, and bringing that back, and, um, and then just farming. I love farming, so I'm excited to start expanding our, our garden. We were gonna do a dry farm, uh, but with the state that the California market is in, I don't know that I want to do it with cannabis anymore. I still have a license for that, at the, almost have a license for that at the local level. I kind of tabled it for a while. I love the idea. I'm still really, really excited about the idea of doing Korean natural farming, dry farmed cannabis. I think it's something that could be really exciting. But the problem with that is then I'm going to be probably sitting on a bunch of product that I have a really hard time moving because California is such high overproduction. So I might just do vegetables down there. We gotta rebuild the road before we can get that. I, I, I'm really excited because this year we're gonna build a barn and get horses. Yay! And donkeys! Right, honey? Don't joke, right? The Don't horses. I'm like, you know, along the lines of Michael's llamas or something. You can't ride a llama. Okay. All right. Try. I guess it's side by side. You guys are side by side. It's not, it's not carrying my fat ass. <laughs> All right, projects for next year. Um, honestly, this is a really cool year for me because there's a lot of projects that I'm excited about in Mass. Um, I'm really starting to see a shift in the attitude store towards sustainability in cultivation of cannabis in Massachusetts. There's, I mean, there's proof in this room. There's a lot more people that are starting to see a need for it, starting to really think about it, and I've gotten more interest this year with people calling me about sustainable facility designs and integrating regenerative agriculture indoors than I've ever gotten before, and they're all from the exact type of people that I want. People that are passionate, people that are in it for the right reasons about their community, really want to create something that they can be proud of. Not people that are just looking you know, for a quick money grab, people that are just looking to turn and burn. So um, that's the exact type of thing that I want to help to you know, instigate and promote in our market, because those are the type of people that we want to see survive and thrive in this market, so that way we can have good quality product by good quality people that's doing good things for our environment. So that's one of the things I'm really super excited about. Um, the other thing that I'm super excited about, but hoping that the first one won't interfere with is farming. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get to farm at all last year. Um, I saw my babies, I said goodbye to them in the nursery, and then my better half and best friends planted them for me while I was in Tennessee with you guys, and then I didn't really get to see them again until harvest. And they came out fantastic, luckily. I mean, natural farming, like they say, it, once the cycle is started, it's almost like a steam engine, and it just can perpetuate itself to some extent. And the more you move it, the faster it goes, the better it perpetuates itself, and you can get to the point where you can back off and just let her guide. And uh, this is three years running in the same beds, and they're, they're really starting to come into their own now. And they, they proved it out by just surviving on their own while I was gone all year, so I'm really excited to get back into this year and test out the uh, biology and see how everything's really handling it. And it still tastes good. <laughs> excitement is a little different than everybody else's because it's a huge shift in my farming for me this next year. Uh, last year was just a horrible season between the wildfires and the smoke and not being able to work in the smoke and not having water and having multiple 10 day over 100 degree, you know, just things you gotta, not fun to work in, but all right, there goes all my pepper flowers. They're dropping off now. My tomato plant flowers, they're gone now. Like that's a whole round of harvesting that's gone. So it was a tough year last year, and I had to be to do a lot of, it wasn't easy to like sit and not farm or not go to the farm and like do things, but to sit and go, okay, how are we gonna change? Like, California's not getting wetter, it's not getting cooler, and I'm not getting younger. So like this tractor is gonna break down eventually. Like how can I do this 
even smarter than like natural farming. Like I gotta think outside. I gotta think business wise. Because again, if I don't make money, then you know I'm just playing in the soil, which I would do anyways. But my wife might think ill of that. Um, <laughs> so the exciting things are kind of amorphous a little bit right now. They're exciting because like I know we can change things. I know we can get things better there. Um, just trying to deal with some of those environmental stresses that like I didn't choose to have happen to me. Like but I gotta deal with them now. Um, so that's a lot of fun stuff, just you know, kind of planning smaller projects and kind of slowing down the farm a little bit as far as specific crops and doing kind of a, not necessarily a monoculture because I'm not a big farm anyway, so, uh, but doing crops where I'm a little less hands-on and I can let those ride and know like my soil is to the point now where I can do that. Like, put it in, let's try out this new crop. Let's try out black sesame seeds. They don't need water, they love heat. I've got that, and I've got a chef that would use them. So I've got a market for it, let's trial it out. We did a small trial last year, we'll do some bigger ones this year. It, interesting crops where it's like, I don't like growing boring things. Like, I mean, jalapenos are great, but they're just boring to me. I'll eat them, but I don't want to grow them. Why? Finger limes. <laughs> I already talked to my chef about finger limes. He was like, eh, and I was like, okay, never mind. Um, he does want me to grow agave for distillery that's a fun project that's coming up so my chef runs a you know the Michelin uh, uh, taqueria so if you're ever in Sacramento hit me up we'll go get tacos it'll be the best ever he grinds the masa every day for the tortillas yes it literally makes a difference for a taco I don't care what's in it the tortilla is amazing uh, but he's opening he's been working through COVID to open this uh, distillery next door so that's like a beautiful new market for me. Like, hey, what can I grow for you? Botanicals, herbs, like that's small. I can do that in my backyard for you. Like, we're there. So that's a fun, I forgot about that one. You're gonna grow so many years. What's that? You're gonna, gonna grow No, it's an eight year crop. Like, wow. <laughs> okay. I don't have the investment to, yeah, go for that whole thing. So maybe he does. He might. Do you wanna grow agave on my farm? In? Come grow agave on my farm. I don't know if they like it there. Yes, they will. No, it's not where they're from in Mexico. I don't think they're gonna Fine. I agree. I agree with Kobe. <laughs> and besides that, like, so a lot of it's like this amorphous <laughs> thing that's in its process currently, even right now. Um, and then the distillery project is a fun one. Just thinking like, ooh, what other things can I grow? Like, I like growing things, so let's try new ones. Uh, the other thing is just, uh, I mean, like when James asked, like, how many people are Canada people here? And it was like, <sighs> it's this great community that like. I've got good friends that I grew up with and stuff, but I know I can count on anybody that was at a class. Like, if I'm stuck somewhere in the country, I probably know someone nearby. I can connect them. I love that connection of getting people like, oh, this person is there. Oh, we got this guy there. I think you guys should like meet and like hang out. Like, maybe something cool could happen. And like, sure, it'd be great to get paid that for that, but I don't think that's gonna happen in the future. But that idea of connecting people and like furthering this on and getting people excited through other people uh, certainly, you know, like going to Ireland and yeah. helping with a class there, or uh, we're all crashing that class, in, by the way. Yeah, I'm going to be in Puerto Rico next week yeah. uh, on a family vacation because we love the island. But we've connected with a couple students from the Puerto Rican classes, and like, how can we help you Tennessee. spread this on the what? So, never mind. Yeah, talking. he was at the Tennessee one last week. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, can, it just spreading that, and I I've, I've got a lot of connections with people in Africa, like hitting me up, doing piggeries, and and coming, it's, it's great to connect people worldwide. That idea of like food connects us all. We all have to eat, and we all want to eat good food, um, taste-wise and for our bodies. Uh, but just be able to connect and share that information with people and give them that little boost to like, yeah, keep going, keep trying this. And yeah, there was a guy in Ghana who started with pigs, did some chickens, and now he's doing vegetables, and he asked me questions. You know, he's got the education. He knows how to do it. It's just these little nuances of like, what do you think about this? Does this work? And just, uh, almost being like, like privileged to be able to help him, like, you're changing in your community. Like, you decided, oh, everybody treats you bad as a farmer. Like, they can just, you know, oh, no, we're only gonna pay you half for that crop. And he's like, I spent all this time to grow it. I'm worth more than that. So he decided, I'm opening my own shop, I'll butcher my pigs, I'll grow my veggies, and I'll feed people all these dishes. I'm just gonna cut out these middlemen that told me like, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. And that resonates to be like, yeah, I had a bunch of people, ah, oh, you're too small, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. I'm like, challenge accepted, let's do it. Uh, so being able to 
uh, pass that on to other people uh, worldwide. Just that, I mean, it's a great feeling and it's nice to connect with people. So those are some of the yeah projects looking forward to. Okay, um, so we, real quick, before, I'm gonna open it up to questions from you guys before we get to them. Um, one more one. What about you? What about you, James? What about you, James? What projects are you looking forward to this next year? Uh, um, so, uh, I am also looking forward to launching products uh, in Oklahoma and relaunching California. I'll get there. I'll that get should there. be number one and getting married to Wendy. Just building up. There. So, in case, uh, in, in case any of you don't know, I'm actually engaged to Wendy. Um, we. <laughs> I know we, I, in the beginning I asked how many of you were in the Facebook group Organic Cultivators. Organic Cultivators was started like two years ago. It was initially just a Michigan-based growing group. I've been growing vegetables for like 25 years uh, in my garden, just this, this small home garden. And uh, I grew a couple of plants when I was 18 in a homemade NFT system. If you don't know what NFT is, it's hydro. It's nutrient down technology. There, exactly. Um, and uh, it, it was fine, it worked great, it grew amazing plants in my closet in my apartment, and it was very illegal. And once I had kids, I just decided I didn't want to take the risk until it became legal recreational in, in Michigan. And then I was like, fuck yeah, I'm gonna grow plants in my basement. And initially I was gonna do hydro again. And my thought was, well, I'm just, you know, I want something fast and now, so I'm gonna put soil in some pots and go with that. And I've been growing outside forever, so why not just do that? And so I was like, I'm gonna find the best soil. I have to research what the best soil to grow cannabis is. And then I ended up stumbling into Joshua Steensley, who um, he's spoken at, I think he's speaking at Regen this year. And um, he's a really, really great guy. And he's all about keeping it simple. Um, the way he talked about having you know, super soils or like hundreds of inputs and um, yeah, if you want to do that, go for it. But you can do a really minimal system and do really well. He does like a modified foods mix. And so I ended up stumbling onto him and then eventually Chris and Korean Natural Farming and um, Jeff Lowenfels and the, the idea of the soil food web. I've been doing all these things in my garden for years that were just common sense to me that were all of these regenerative practices, but I had no idea the science behind it. I had no idea the people behind it. I've never followed anyone in the cannabis industry. I have no idea, like everyone knows Patrick King, everyone knows Kevin Jodry, who will be joining us via Zoom tomorrow. And I, I don't know these people, but I like growing plants. So I started this group and it just kept growing and growing and growing and it became a worldwide thing. And at that point I was like, I need help. I, I don't know it all. I'm still very new to, like, I know a lot about green natural farming. I haven't utilized it a lot on a large scale. That's the difference. Wendy, Chris, Kobe, Ben, they're utilizing this technology, if that's what you want to call it. It's really a system. Um, they're utilizing it at a large scale. Chris took a long time to, to work out how to make something that's really just used on one acre farms. Um, at a commercial level and make it successful and make it so we can start reversing what we've done to the planet. Anyway, long-winded story. Um, I started looking for moderators to help me do that. And I asked a bunch of people um, from other Facebook groups like the Probiotic Farmers Alliance and the Creative Natural Farming groups and uh, Wendy and Kobe and Ben and Chris and Suzanne and all these other people are, are helping run this group. And uh, that's how I met Wendy. And now we're engaged and uh, I live in California and help manage the farm. And I've uh, been pushing for the products to get launched into Oklahoma and other places because uh, if you haven't tried it, the muscle salve is amazing and we really hope to get it out to the people who need it. So that's what I'm excited about. I'm also really excited about uh, the changes that have happened in my life since creating natural farming happened or uh, since I discovered it. It's uh, totally changed everything in my life. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for that. I saw somebody with a hand up back there. I was gonna say really quickly, <clears throat> just realizing that we are actually, so when we originally started this conference, we were gonna have an co-C moderator 
Tim. And we have one. And where's Tim? Yeah, Tim's. Oh yeah, Tim. Tim's one of our moderators. Tim's one of our moderators. Tim's amazing. <laughs> Patrick, you're not a moderator on our Muscle Patrick. Muscle, 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 He's also yeah. helping us launch in Oklahoma, so. <laughs> <laughs> but if you know Patrick, you also do know that he doesn't launch things or stand behind things he doesn't believe in. <laughs> All right, who else has questions? something to yourself and the land. And I think Chris touched on a lot of that with the philosophy. It's a way to save money. It's a way to reverse what we've done. Not everyone has the ability to do it or do all of it where they live. You can get really creative and, and I might be at going against the grain with, with some of the people on the panel. Um, you can get really, really creative with it and you can do a lot. You can travel, you can get, I don't know, drive hours, find a place and do it. And, in Michigan, where I'm at, for like old growth forest, I had, had to drive three hours to place a good IMO box. But you can do it, walk off somewhere, remember, set it on your phone or a GPS thing, get back there, and you'll be fine. You'll get good IMO. You just have to work for it. Some people don't have the time. Some people would rather buy something. The, the problem with that is, unless you know for sure that it was made properly, you don't know what you're getting. And that's the big issue with it. So um, I highly recommend if you are going to source k &F product, find somebody who really knows what they're doing and help them support their farm and get it from them. Don't follow hype, don't follow followers on Instagram, I'm not gonna name names, but there are people that are making k &F inputs and they're fucking wrong. They're not made right. We've seen how they're made. We've smelled them, like it, they're not right. And if you haven't gone to a class, and Chris is right, you can learn a lot. I learned a shit ton from YouTube videos, like a lot. And if you're smart, you can pick up a lot and make those connections. Going to a farm that knows how to do this properly or a class, like one of the classes that Chris puts on. I know Wendy's planning on putting on some classes here soon. It is indispensable being able to taste and smell things that are made properly. The whole reason I paid to go to Chris's class was to smell an IMO vial. Because I didn't know anyone who was doing this in Michigan. So for me, like I can I can follow all the directions on the video. I'm sure I would have nailed it after a while, maybe, who knows, but I still wouldn't know. I don't know what baking bread smells like. And newsflash, everyone smells shit differently. What smells sweet to her might smell sour to me. And we've gone over this at the IMO vial in Tennessee. The way she described it was not how I smelled it. But now I know what to what to look for, what to smell for. Sorry, guys, I'm going to take that from you, but he took my ahead. answer. <laughs> no, but but what James is saying is really true. So it's not it's not necessarily I'm not anti bottle KNF. I'm not anti you know organic nutrients and supplements and things like that that are come in plastic bottles. It's just more about making more conscientious choices, and part of that is. Like we're saying, like Suzanne's saying, knowing who to follow and who to listen to. Just because you have a lot of content and you have a lot of hype and people like to repost you and wear your gear does not mean you actually have the experience of what you're doing. Mislabeling things when you're calling it 
you know, when, when you're just selling it through one online dispensary or distributor and yourself and you're labeling it however you want and you're not under the scrutiny of the Department of Ag, so you are not following labeling laws, it's easy to do. So, you know, it's just, this is meant to be something that you are supposed to learn how to do yourself. Admitting also on that same note that sometimes you have to creatively think on how to do that. And sometimes you can't supplement all of your needs if you're, you know, an indoor, like there are some states, I think, um, I think Florida might be one of them that doesn't allow you to grow anything other than you know, cannabis in your cannabis farm, which is ridiculous. Um, and this brings us back to that advocacy thing over and over and over again. <laughs> I'll touch on that over and over and over again, <laughs> that you need to speak for what your needs are and you need to keep fighting for them because eventually they'll cave. Um, but uh, yeah, but you know, if you need to buy something, buy it. If it's a step in the right direction, it's a step in the right direction, but then continue to think in that right direction. Don't buy a bottle and then 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 buy a bottle and just say, well, this is easier. Return it to them, ask them to refill it for you. Ask them to <laughs> refill it. Ask somebody to go find a, find a farmer friend and say, can I come and like harvest your, can I help, help you me weed? Let me get some of it. I guarantee any farmer out there is going to be like, yeah, come help me weed. You know, and in return, you know, if you'd like to do a little test plot and do some KNF on it, like I'll bring you some products back. Um, so, you know, it's not that I'm down on people that are producing quote unquote KNF products. I just, I have yet to find one that when I delve into it, they actually have like legit training behind them and they know what they're doing and they're doing it right. So also be aware that FPJ and FPE are not the same thing. Okay, FPE is a fermented plant extract. It's not the same thing as a fermented plant juice. Um, and there's a lot of products that are going around that and that is more of a Jadam style uh, purification in a bucket. And if that's what you're gonna buy, like, Dude, I'll start producing it for y'all because that's seriously costs no money and you're buying a jug of water. And you might as well just go buy a pumpkin and do it yourself. So. I think that really what you need to just think about is like any cultivation sourcing, doing yeah. your sourcing responsible. Um, if you're not able to make it yourself or it takes too much time for you, find somebody that's local to you that does have proper training and does know how to do it. Offer to help them for an afternoon in exchange for some of the you know, fermentations that they make. You don't necessarily have to learn and do it all yourself accurately. You can go and help somebody. Like I have people that don't really know how to do it. They come to my farm and we go out first thing in the morning before dark and before sun up and we do some harvesting for FPJs and not at three in the morning after being in Tennessee. Oh, that was um, the best morning. Six in the morning, my bad. Um, that, that, that was, that that was, was a beautiful morning. It was Gorgeous. Beautiful. It was great. It's wonderful. But we do it a little bit more reasonable. Um, like and then I help them make the extracts and then they come back in a couple of weeks and I give them some of the mason jar and they bring back the same jar. So you're able to help people in that way. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to do it all or nothing with this. Steps in the right direction. Just consistently steps in the right direction. Farming with friends is more fun. Fact. <laughs> I, I just tell people like, do you know, there's no, there's no cap on the knowledge. Nobody's regulating what you do with it. There's, there's a culture, you know, that's, um, you know, and it's doing things right or being conscientious of what you're doing and talk about that. And that's probably the most important to me that people are going to make products. That was always going to happen. There's, you know, I don't care because the reality is whether people are doing great, making a bunch of products using these methods, if they're doing it right, like, world's being regenerated, farmers are getting cheaper products or healthier food, you know. Um, but uh, I've had, yeah, I've had people that I knew were input maker businesses come to my class and be like, yeah, this is how you scale it though, you know, and talk to them about how to how to do it at scale or cut, cut costs and increase efficiency because it's, you know, it's okay. But yeah, I mean, like anything, you don't want to buy crap, so figure that out. And even though this is not my wheelhouse at all, the sister to this is the microbial pesticides, the Bavarias, the Isarias, the Metarisiums. People think they can grow these in their basement and sell them to the cannabis growers. And that line of products is EPA um, regulated. And so I've taken it upon myself the last few years to start collecting these 
non-regulated products from the cannabis industry because it's the only place I find them. I'm going to talk a little bit about this on Sunday, but so far we found aspergillus in products being sold to growers to spray on their plants, human pathogen, don't really want to be spraying that. You'll, you, you can't sell your crop with that on it. That's what you're tested for. We found um, Abbott this last year in a product. Um, some products just has nothing viable in it. Um, yeah, we're finding some crazy stuff, but the cannabis growers are just buying bugs in a bottle and don't really know what's in it. So I don't know how susceptible all the KNF stuff is for pathogens and plant, plant pathogens, human pathogens, but we're, again, we're seeing it on the entomopathogenic fungi side of things. Yeah, you can get, um, you can get some gnarly stuff um, and stuff made the wrong way or improperly stored. The problem with some of these uh, natural farming inputs is they are fine in a lot of scenarios with a breathable lid. Um, as soon as you cap them and they sit in the bottle and they heat up and cool down, um, FPJ, if not pasteurized, turns to alcohol and somebody overdoses FPJ and sprays them on a leaf, you can burn leaves and you can, uh, you can get some gnarly um, kind of um, just bacteria that will do the same thing. It will promote wilt or, or disease. And so it's, it's, it's a real problem. I try not to scare people, but you know, it's definitely can be pretty detrimental to spray. We even had somebody talking at a, at a conference one time and he was, describing things he's doing with Jadong, but not fully explaining that, hey, I've done it like this, and I've tried you know, trial and error, and I've found my sweet spot with what I do, but my mistakes were killing a lot of plants you know, in the process. <laughs> and so he's kind of like, do it like this, and it's like, we, if you just do it just like that, and, and the point is, um, there's, there's methodology, um, there's some, you know, um, I, I would encourage people, you wanna try something, um, uh, I have a video maintenance solution and it's this very simple thing. You can spray it once a week, um, with, with almost, there's no downside, you know, if you have, as long as you have decent products, you made it well, or you got it from somebody that made it well, no downside. You can spray it all the time. It's just kind of a health tonic for plants. It will make them shine and make them happy. And you can't really mess that up. Um, and other than that, you know, the stuff you hear on the internet, just be cautious. <laughs> All right, so we're getting pretty close to the time. We're going to wrap up for dinner. We're going to take one more question. I see Mr. Duke in the back. So, in regards to this, yeah. can doctors go back on the mic for you? But as far as comparing a pain that product in a jug and something that you made with a tent in regards to the you know, uh, presentation this morning with love, and you're actually making a relationship, you know, with a microbiome that you bring into the plant that you probably love um, real quick. How would you factor that intent that you're making these Korean natural farming products, and then how your plant relates to it? Like, what are you actually making with that intent, as opposed to buying something off the shelf? Is that a real factor? I like that question. I, I'm a believer that it is. But I do think that a lot of that comes down to belief. I, I do think that intention carries real, real end results. Um, and part of that, I was talking to somebody at break and we were talking about cannabis specifically and I don't know what it is, but Nikki and Swami swear by that this is true, that a happy farmer produces a better end product and you can tell. They've been judging the Emerald Cup since it's been going on, so we're on in nine, Teen years, I think, is what it is. I don't, I don't even actually know. But one of the interesting things that they've noted is throughout the years, the people that are winning are the people that have been doing this for a really long time because they really love doing it. Um, the first Emerald Cup that we entered, we put two flowers in up against 658 other entries, both of them placed in the top 20. I'd never entered anything before. And one of ours was an XJ13, it placed 17th. There were like six or seven other XJ13s entered that year. None of them was in the top 50. I don't think that's because I'm some superior geneticist that did something special or, you know, at that point I wasn't doing Korean natural farming. We were just doing organic, but so were a lot of those other farmers. What made our stand out? What made it different? Uh, Nikki and Swami will tell you that it's the intention of the farmer. 
If that's true or not, I don't know. I do know that when I'm happy and I'm in my garden, I'm definitely paying more attention. So it could be something as simple as being in there more because you're happy in there makes you be more mindful, makes you see problems before they become problematic. Um, you know, it just, I don't know. The um, part of the philosophy of that farming is the, um, yeah. <laughs> he just said he wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> What is the um, care we have for what we're doing? The idea is that we have the paternal or maternal care for our, our animals or our profits. They, these are children. And so the question just gets thrown back, like, would you feed it to your kids? You know, um, that's it. That's, that's all I got. Um, I'll follow up. Well, let me follow up and then can, uh... okay. Um, I am very, very anti woo. I'm not a fan. Of, if you like, there are hot button words for me. Biodynamics is a hot button word. Chakra is kind of a hot button word. Um, that being said, uh, I've actually been able to correlate the attitude of the person planting plants and seeing um, the difference in the field. It's pretty wild. You can actually tell if you planted what plant. Um, and, uh, that's, you know, whether, like Wendy said, w whether that's, they're more caring in transplanting and the other person is just like, fuck, I gotta get this done. It's really hot out here and I'm tired of being here and I've been poked five times and stung and I have poison oak. Um, <laughs> that's me. Personal story. <laughs> yeah. California hates me. Poison oak is Um, but yeah, but, yeah, I have been able to see that. So even as like an anti person, I, if there is something to that, whether it's um, the, you know, the intention to either way, whether it's a spiritual thing or um, you just have more care and love for the plant, it definitely does show through. Okay. Yeah, I am. Cause I actually, because I know we're getting close to break, but I really wanted, oh, did you, did you talk yet? No. Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. um, I was just going to say to, to what you were talking about, John, um, I mean, there's the age old adage that plants grow in the shadow of the farm. And when I first heard that, I thought it was kind of counterintuitive. I'm like, no, they need sunlight. But <laughs> as, as I've learned more about how your intentions and your relationship with your plants really impacts final quality. I mean, personally, I actually believe that there's a, there's a, a canopy limit at which point you start to lose the ability to be in contact with the plants because there's simply not enough hours in the day. There's not enough time in your work week to have an intimate relationship. Like, think about how many friends can you have? and actually give each one of those friends what they deserve and what they need as a friend. It's it's a very relatable concept. It's like family. So I think that, yeah, it really comes down to why it's made and with what intention it's made. And if the intention is profit, then you know, the end result's not going to be necessarily the love that you would look for. Now you can steal it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Sorry, I just wanted to tell you guys that in my slides, thank you, Quinn, for catching it. It's supposed to be for 10 gallons, not for 100. So... So that is that is totally my bad. So just uh yeah, it's it's a work in progress. It was a test. It was a test. Yeah, it was a test. We the only one that passed. Yeah. Quinn said everybody else who's here and has taken the K and F classes and things. If you're K and F, you're you're all just fired and I don't know. <laughs> yeah, good. Good, good excuse. Couldn't see it from that. Um, so my apologies on that. Um, there's there's a few. Snafus in there. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is actually, I'm going against one of the things that Chris said about the roly poly bugs. So he said that they'll eat your mulch and they're not going to really be a problem. We have been seeing that this is actually not really true and that you can keep mulching. For some reason, there's a tipping point in the population where they will start to eat your weed and they will continue to eat your weed no matter what else you do, possibly with the exception of ryegrass. And I really need to follow up with Joshua Steenslin about that. He was one of the yeah, first people, like, the reason why I knew him is we were the first people. They're always the problem. Yeah, we, we, well, you were saying just keep mulching and things, and I'm like, no, it, it's mulch. not. Just I found the best way to deal with it yeah, is to leave for six true. months and not water anything, and then they're all dead. <laughs> yeah, that works. <laughs> or pulling, if for us, what we had to do, we were in a greenhouse, so we pulled all of our mulch. We let everything go fallow for the winter. We left it all open. They skedaddled because they had nowhere to stay, and then it was it was manageable from then on. Joshua Steensman that James mentioned, um, he and I both had the same problem at the same time. This was four or five years ago. 
and everything online said, this is not a problem. These bugs are not a problem. These are beneficial. They're great. They eat, you know, debris and you're okay. And we were like, oh, well, this is not okay. His response was to plant ryegrass and to keep planting it at such rates that as they mowed it down, he was being able to keep the next batch sprouting quickly enough. He also had them flooding through the walls of his house from his garage. So I don't know if that's the best situation. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's one of those things that be mindful of the roly polies. If you see them starting to get out of control, like don't just keep mulching, figure something else out. <laughs> and same thing with springtails, because I know everybody in the cannabis industry loves it. And in under other industries, they don't because springtails, there's a lot of different species and we do see damage from them feeding on plant material. So you have to be careful of that. The other thing I would say too is that I was in a basement in tents and one or two roly poles turned into like a fucking million. And when you pulled away the tent, because I had a grassroots by the bed, and they're a little moist down on the bottom around the tent, and they would just congregate there, and you'd pull it back, and it would smell like just crustacean. It was rotten crap. It's uh, disgusting. All right. Um, before we uh, bounce out of here for dinner, I'm sure everybody's hungry. Uh, a couple things, and uh, I just have uh, a little end of, end of first day spiel. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming out here. This has been amazing. I'm really happy with the turnout. I'm really happy that everyone is um, excited to be here and, and making connections. And you guys all have great questions. And this has been amazing. Um, so give yourself a round of applause. This is great. Um, I just want to, and I will bring this up again tomorrow, but I just want to reiterate um, that on Sunday when Suzanne is doing her talk, you guys can't record or take pictures. Okay? Well, you can like take like a picture of the slides. I kind of freak out about the video thing and someone sitting there with your camera in your face. Something traumatic happened to me that I don't know about, but it just, it really... She'll let you know what you can do and what you can't do. Yes. So, um... Don't abuse what she can let you do, because she'll come after you. Yeah. Um, Limo. Limo will be done at noon tomorrow. It will be here to be scoped. I'm going to try to figure out a way to get it up on the big screen so we can all talk about it. Yeah. You got HDMI out? Sorry. Yeah. We'll talk about it after. I need to hook it up with my system. Great. Beautiful. So, uh, the plan is hopefully to have it up there and we can all talk about it after lunch or whatever. Um, tomorrow's going to be a longer day, so I'm prepared for that. It's Saturday, we're going we're gonna to do a long day. Um, tomorrow, Kevin Jodry will be joining us via Zoom. His daughter has diabetes, so he, he doesn't want to fly out. So we're going to let him join via Zoom, and hopefully it all works out. He'll be... Uh, he might be our first Zoom call, so we're just going to cross our fingers on that one. Um, Dan Kittredge will be here tomorrow. He'll be here early. Show up early. And got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, he Please plans don't on. Make cannabis industry look bad. He doesn't know us. <laughs> Dan is an organic farmer. He's been doing it for like 30 years. His uh, parents helped start NOFA, uh, the organization in the back corner there, that were uh, nice enough to help sponsor and uh, bring uh, microscopes out. Uh, they do a lot of work with connecting farmers uh, in the local area, and I know Dan will probably touch on that. Um, the next thing on the list was Wendy's cane ethnic mistake, which she already covered that. Um, and the last test, thing. Test. It was a test. It was a test. It was a test. Yeah. Test. No, I still make mistakes. Like yeah. that's, I think that's part of being a good educator too. Is like saying like, hey, I screwed this up. Like, don't try and hide it. I wasn't gonna let you guys go home and you know underuse something. Be like, this doesn't work at all. It's my job. You know, it's, uh, it's important to to own up to the. We'll get the corrected version up on the website, and I'll uh, send an email to everybody, and uh, you'll know when it's up. Um, we hope that we see you there. If not, we're definitely going to connect in the after hours over the next couple days. Make sure you talk to the speakers. They're, they're more than willing. Like Kobe said, you know, come find me, and you know, we'll, we'll go out and whatever. So. Um, Talk to the speakers, make those connections. There's some really smart people in the crowd, um, the KNF students, the Gan students, they're, they're good connections to have. So, um, last thing before we leave, because uh, I kind of forgot, is uh, Kobe, Ben, Wendy, Suzanne, Chris, we already covered, uh, but Suzanne. 
where can people find you? Where can they get in touch with you? What's your website? It's oh, all the business. So we're just saying, if you want to find me, because I'm not going to the consumption evening lounges. Yeah, Suzanne will not. She's going to smoke. She won't be there. Yeah. So if anybody that did go, I'm going to, I have nothing to do tonight. So if it wants to hang out in somewhere, and we can sit. You guys can hang out here. I'll come yeah. and close up later. Yeah, we'll hang out somewhere. Oh, and all right. <laughs> well, we can go inspect our plants and bugs, but I'll be around. Um, but if you're looking, if my cards are in the back, that has all my contact information. But my website is bugladyconsulting.com. But most of my social media is all under Bug Lady Suzanne, like on Instagram, Twitter, um, wherever else I am. Wendy, uh, you can find um, at Sunvis or Sunvis.com. And they're all in the Facebook group too, so if you're not in it, go join them. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> um, what's that? Yeah, well, yeah, there are questions, and they're difficult. But here's the thing: you can use Google, and that's the point of the questions. In case you guys don't know, we make you work for it. We don't want to do all the work for you. We have work. We have kids. Wendy and I have five kids. It takes a lot to do this stuff, and we all give our free time educating people for free and helping them through Facebook. So if you're going to be in the group, there's three questions. I think she needs questions in the group. Oh, so questions in the group? <laughs> well, so what's really funny is there's actually hard questions to get in the group. We make people Google. So, um, and we deny people who don't answer. Yeah, if you don't answer, you don't get in. So, you know. Um, ben? Where can people find you at? Uh, KatieFarmsFamily.com, Benjamin and Katie Farms at uh, Benjamin and Katie Farms Family at uh, Instagram and yeah. Katie Farms Family on Instagram. It's all also in our uh, information if you want to back to you. Uh, come get me also at any point in time. I'm always happy to chat. I'm always happy to chat. And lastly, definitely not lastly. Is that a word? Is that a word? It is now. I made it up. Yeah. It's a word now. It's my word. Yeah, so uh, Kobe Guy. It's Fairly easy name to remember. Uh, we have mistaken for Kobe Bryant a lot, so we can't do that. Uh, Cellar Door Collective, uh, where if you look up Cellar Door, you'll probably find me. It's not Cellar Door Farm, Cellar Door Collective. Uh, on Instagram, we have a Facebook page, don't really much on there. Uh, it's a busy farm. Uh, and I'll be educating people on the Facebook group. That's what I'm doing on Facebook, is answering questions, not doing that. But, um, Clubhouse. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Clubhouse, we do a group on Wednesdays and kind of just open it and ask any questions. Uh, we get some good conversations. A lot of us, like Quinn, who's in May, in California, and like, well, we miss each other. Like, we get to have a chat about like what's going on at our farm. And like, hey, have, you, have you tried this? I'm working on this weird experiment. Like, what do you think? Like, nothing's off the next week. It's every Wednesday, so you hear about like what they were doing last week. You find out they failed. Yeah, see this. It's very fun. And another thing I was going to say, uh, just yeah, find us, fully willing to talk, um, uh, uh, buying buying ferments or whatever, not on the buying part, but barter your time at a farm, like they were saying, like if you have time, like, we're also all have jobs and stuff, and sometimes that's the issue, you don't have time to make these things if you don't set aside some time, but Sam, he was on the West Coast, he needed some John Sulfur and some other things. Buy some for you from you. I said, no, but we can barter something. Like, I can just give them to you. He's like, no, 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 no. I got this, work this great dairy, dropped off this. I, I feel like I got more out of that deal. And, like, because I didn't want money. I didn't want, like, let's have a cool exchange. Like, that's awesome. And to this day, my wife still is like, that was great. We ruined chocolate milk. Yep. This was the greatest chocolate milk ever. And so she's still, yeah, which I never would have known about that milk. I never would have run across that dairy, even though they're really close to me, except for the fact that it's like, no, you can't pay me for it, I'll just give it to you. <coughs> extra. Or, yeah, that's part of us. That's cool. You guys have a lot of really valuable, desirable products that if you don't have time, you can do a little trade. Yeah. I'm trying to start a new thing. Ask Kobe when and where you can buy his hot sauce. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, real quick. 
Uh, it's it's an app that forever I hated because it wasn't on Android. I just recently downloaded and I used it one time to go on a podcast that I've done. Yeah, so um, it's actually a really cool platform where people can connect and talk to each other. There's no video, right? It's no live video. It's just audio, so you can basically raise your hand or you can invite it into the room. You have to be invited to Clubhouse. You have to know somebody. So find one of these people on Clubhouse, and hopefully they can send you an invite. Um, but yeah, I think it's really valuable. There, I've actually sat in on some of the Korean natural farming chats. Um, there's a little bit of arguing that goes on in there, but that's actually really amazing because you get to hear farmers talk about what works on their farm, and everybody's farm is different, and you're, you're you are the ruler of your own farm. So what works on your farm might not work on another farm. Um, you know, I it was. Get to hear intonation in someone's voice. You know, yeah. Read something and go, that's huge. Sure. And you're like, oh no, who's just If you want to invite the Clubhouse, I have some available. I need your phone number. Uh, I don't really use and it. And I don't like talking on the phone, and it's almost like talking on the phone, but it's been such a better option than trying to type out. Like, is that going to sound weird to somebody? Are they going to take that? Like, I'm being snarky. Like, I don't want that to come across that way. Yeah. So it's been a great even though I, You can call me, I'm not going to answer the phone, but somehow I get on every week to, like, help people out. And I think a lot of that sprung up because of COVID. We've been separated. We desire that connection that kind of gives you that local intonation and understanding of each other. So I'm just that cool. And something along with that too, because I said, you know, every farm is different, every I don't think we really always think about how different things are. I lived in Michigan for over 30 years. I grew plants in one place. It's fucking flat there. Elevation was never something I thought about until I came to California. There are things that you might not think are that different between your place and another, but you just didn't think about it yet. It's That's why I get people contacting me asking to buy a set of SOPs that will do it. Because they have to be different for every mm -hmm. single facility. And you can't, don't buy any prepackaged pest management program. They have to be detailed for your facility, your pest, your environment, and everything. So, and that's true for your build out of your facility, your transition of your facility, like the whole thing. Again, what works on one part doesn't necessarily work on the other. Yeah, if you're going to pay, at least get something that's tailored. <coughs> you know, if you have to put money into it, then have it designed for you. Don't just go get a one size fits all. Because you'll get a one size fits all. So I'm a high on, and I definitely don't remember mm -hmm. which is which. You're high on? I'm a high on. Yeah, high on. Well, I heard you say it. It doesn't mean... You never heard the expression high on? No. <sighs> I run with an intelligent crowd that uses You never heard of kind bud either. I don't want to hear Oh, I've heard of it. A little bit. I just don't think it's a cultivar. I never said it was a cultivar. I I said did. it was a term that was referred Bull to one shit. kind of weed that we got all the time as a kid. Bullshit! You said it was a certain I never strain. Said it. it was yes. That's the, cultivar. What? Did you just hear that? We did anybody else hear that? Was that a term. yes, no exact contradiction of self? We sure used that's... a term, kind bud, to describe one cultivar that we got all the time. KB? Teenagers. Yeah. KB is not a real thing. It's not a real thing. Okay. Jesus it's Christ. like bro. So that's okay. Oh my you god, what's a drug? Oh, so, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was called just drug. Yeah, and, Dude, and, I and, a and because there's a hole, there's a hole in the stem. There's a hole in the stem, and that's how you know it's hydro. What? Yes. Oh my god. Yes. That hurts my head. It, I, we were 16, okay? Like, so this is my I point. I was 16 once, also. I never this would believe that point. shit. Well, you grew up a different life than we did. Well, Thank you very much. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. This was eleven twenty. This was bagged eleven twenty nine, I think.
Michael? You gave him the only key? <laughs> you gave him the only key. I didn't give him a goddamn thing. You have a key? Well, you can get a new teammate at the... I didn't give him a key. You can get a new teammate. So how does he have a key? Is he gonna be in the hallway? He's gonna hey be guys, in the hallway with his Hey guys, do you know how many keys he's had made since he's been here? No. Let's go to the desk. Oh my god! That's the Esmeralda that I've been hearing about! Oh yeah, that's the two today. I don't know her name. I told my lady, but it got Esmeralda the first time I was there. I've actually called her that twice to her. She doesn't know. Shocking. I don't think she thinks I'm talking to her. I don't know. I'm not sure. Alright. Sorry. James, you and I don't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Straight off. No, we'll just, yeah. So that's not, I already fucked up, so let's start over. <laughs> you can't start over? Oh, shit. God no, damn don't it, Zach. Don't that one. Don't touch that one. It's, it's supposed to be too dark. So, <laughs> it's really... <laughs> shit, 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 shit. What's the best one? Which one do you like the most? B. B. Absolutely. A B, then close. A, then C. Man. Right? Oh, shit. Right? 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, hard win, um, moderately close second, not even yeah, in the running. Close. Yeah, and this one... Uh, not yeah. even in the running. Not yeah. to mention, it started to degrade the actual structure of it. It yeah. has become brittle, crispy, that'll just it's shatter dry. in a grinder. Yeah, it's Are gonna you guys be ready? Done. This yep. is still pretty good. Uh, this is That right. for sure, I know. 